Welcome back to Murder at the Funeral Home. This episode, we are covering the O'Connell Funeral Home Murders up in Wisconsin. We're going to begin our story this time sharing about the victims and their services. This crime is a wild one that took several years to conclude. So let's get started. Our story takes place in Hudson, Wisconsin. Now, the Republic Eagle reports it was a cold Tuesday afternoon on February 5th, 2002, when the police received a call at about 1.40 p.m. from Marty Shanklin. He was the St. Croix County Medical Examiner, and he had stopped by O'Connell Funeral Home to get some signatures on a death certificate or pick up a death certificate. He found Dan O'Connell, 39 years old, and 22-year-old intern James Ellison dead in the business office, shot to death. Now, Dan O'Connell was in his chair as if he had been just sitting talking to someone, and James Ellison was found kind of as if he had stood and was getting out of the room and was shot in the back. Shanklin immediately left the scene. He didn't know if someone was still there. He didn't know if there was still a crime in in place. So he left and called the police. They responded quickly and with urgency. They swept the scene. They checked for perpetrators. Helicopters were brought in and responders were brought in, but there's nothing they could do for the two victims. They went door to door searching for clues. No one could have known the person that they were looking for. No one's minds even went there. Now, Dan's service took place. It was the largest in Hudson history ever. Took place on Saturday for their funeral director, their community leader. He was married with two elementary school age children. He was a Rotarian, a volunteer ambulance attendant. One of the clergy sitting at the altar who would deliver one of the scriptures was Father Ryan Erickson, and the other was Father Peter Slazinski. They delivered a homily. Over 1,300 people were at the service, which took two hours. Now, Dan's wife, Jenny, said he always knew how to talk with people about their loss, how to reach them, how to make them feel better. One time, a Hudson family lost their daughter in an accident. The dad didn't have a suit to wear to the funeral and Dan took off his jacket and had this father try it on. He said, don't worry, I'll lend you everything you need. He was just that kind of guy. Now, Dan was buried at St. Patrick's Cemetery in a procession led by 64 ambulance, fire and police vehicles reflected his work as an EMT. Got goosebumps. Sometimes picturing some of these things just, ooh. Um, pretty powerful. Now, intern James Ellison was 22 years old and was pursuing a degree in mortuary science at the University of Minnesota. He had also attended UW UW River Falls for two years. Now, his obituary states, James was a person who always wanted to help those in need. He was always there to be a good friend with his caring nature. He had a hard time saying no to people. He felt like he'd let them down. When deciding to become a mortician, James said, I'm so proud that I could help people at the worst time in their lives. While he attended UWRF, Ellison cleaned house for the James and Isla June Pratt family, and he became a mentor for the Pratt's sons. In honor of James, his parents even established a scholarship for students in the mortuary science program at the University of Minnesota, and the university graduated James posthumously with his class. His funeral was held on Monday, February 11th, and he was buried at Wayside Cemetery in Barron. Now, the Hudson Star Observer said the Hudson Police Chief Marty Jensen was a sergeant at the time. It was tasked as the media contact for the HPD. It was his first experience on a high-profile murder case. He says, we needed to balance what the community and press wanted to know while keeping some facts and details of the case and the investigation secret. And Paramount was dealing with the families. We knew that the key to unlocking what happened might come from someone who knew details we didn't release to the public. I got to interject here for a second because we all have seen this happen over and over. We want more information. We want to know 
Then claims go out. We just saw this in the murders, the four individuals that died in Ohio or Idaho that were killed, that everybody said, well, the police don't know what's going on. And belittling them because they thought they weren't getting anywhere. But from day one, they had that suspect on their radar. But if they tell the world all of this, how can they get the information they need? They got to keep some things to themselves. We don't need to know everything the police knows, but we really do like to know information, don't we? We are we are a crime information driven society right now, I think. So in the end, them keeping that information was what led to the person believed to be the murderer. They made it a point to ask anyone they came into contact with questions or took into custody if they knew or had heard anything about the O'Connell murder. So no matter who they were talking to, whether if it was for this case or not, they asked them that question. And it was while in investigating an allegation of sexual abuse of an adolescent boy from Somerset by a Catholic priest that that question paid off. So Father Ryan Erickson, and if you'll remember, he had been at the funeral and delivered the homily, came to St. Patrick shortly after his ordination in 2000. He was a controversial associate pastor, garnering loyal support from some parishioners, but kind of pissing off a lot of them. And he left the parish shortly after the murders. After questioning Erickson about the abuse charge, Knops and Petit, who were the officers, asked him if he knew anything or detectives about the O'Connell case. He calmly said he did and gave them details that had never been released. This is why you hold the information quiet. Unbeknownst to the mourners at the funeral, he had given a homily, at and the police, Father Ryan had exchanged intense words with Dan O'Connell the day before the killing. And he had been shaken by that conversation, something nobody knew. Just days after the murders, the police announced that they had sp- suspects and they were working to narrow the list. One of the early theories was that this religious group that opposed embalming practices. I have never heard of this, but they're called Rest of Jesus. They're based in Augusta, Wisconsin, and they had sent threatening letters to more than 400 funeral homes, including the O'Connell funeral home. But they got dismissed pretty early on as being potential suspects. Weeks turned into months and months into years, and it became apparent that many of the suspects were cleared. Now, a bishopaccountability.org um, reported this. If the investigators had been looking, they might have noticed that the church itself seemed to be a center of intrigue. There were threats against the school's principal, who'd resign under the sustained assault of Father Ryan's most fervent followers. There was Father Ryan's gun collection and his history of binge drinking, something that had happened to this once peaceful, something had happened to this once peaceful 150-year-old parish to cleave it down the middle, and Father Ryan was a central figure in the conflict. So in late April of 2002, a $100,000 reward was offered for information. They wanted to close this case. They wanted resolve for the victim's families. They announced that they were looking for a white male with a medium build wearing a white t-shirt and a baseball cap. If someone with that description had be, been seen at the funeral home between 1 and 1.30, the day of the murder. Pretty vague, but it's something. In late May, they made a public plea. We need the public's help. This is a heinous crime, as serious as it gets. We're not going to quit until we find who did it, but we're not magicians. Anyone with information has a moral responsibility to come forward and not wait until we contact them. It doesn't work that way. They were urging people to give them any more nuggets of information to help put some pieces together. Now, the first real break in the case came two years later in April of 2004 when they were investigating that report that Father Ryan Erickson sexually assaulted a juvenile boy while a priest in Hudson. 
and that he provided the boy and his friends with alcohol when they came to the rectory. So they had come, they kept, they came to this person that they kept circling back to. They learned he owned weapons. And when they interviewed him, he revealed those details. And when asked how he knew the details, he said, oh, they came from the other priest who was outside the funeral home on the day of the murder. Or, oh, it came from Dan's brother and sister. Everyone denied telling him any information. They confiscated all of his guns. They could not find an alibi for him on the day of the murders. Also was reported that he told um, a deacon at St. Mary's, I done it and they're going to catch me. The deacon repeats the conversation to his wife and a church secretary. On December 13th of 2004, a public defender contacted police and said his office was representing Erickson. He wasn't going to take a polygraph test. The police were narrowing in on him and he was getting scared. They did a search warrant at the rectory in the office, took computers, clothing, personal items, papers, including a last will and testament. In the letter, Erickson denies the murders and said police will find no DNA. He admits to being plagued since youth, giving into lust and passion. He's scared. His friends drove to where Erickson was now living in Hurley to spend the weekend because they're concerned about the investigation and the impact it was having on their friend. They said he was depressed, but that he seemed to be in a better mood later on in the evening. But at 8 a.m. just before the morning mass on December 19th, 2004, his friend Rick Reams finds Erickson hanging in the hallway between the church and the direct rectory that he had hung himself. So as the details unfold in these later years, it's suspected that Ellison Sally was in the wrong place at the wrong time. O'Connell apparently had arranged to meet with Father Erickson at the funeral home to discuss Erickson's abusive behavior and what was happening allegedly with him and the younger boys at the church. He had brought a nine millimeter gun to this meeting, which you don't bring a gun if you're just having a discussion, unless you're planning to use it. So Erickson, by all cases, committed the crime that day. He took two lives to save his reputation, just tarnishing his memory by that. This closed the case and it allowed the community to move forward with his death. Some do still question if Erickson did it or if he did commit suicide or if somebody made it look like suicide. So there is some that still question this case and question whether it's as cut and dry as it appears. Now, the James Ellison Foundation for the Protection of Children was established, a nonprofit for helping to protect and counsel abused victims. So this is a way that James's family has created something in the aftermath of his death to help people, to help children. So that organization is there. Look to support it if you would like to support um, from this story. This is another story of murder at the funeral home. I remember when this happened. I had just been licensed. And when we first heard of this, there was a lot of talk of why this happened. This, this funeral director and his apprentice were murdered. Had someone been trying to rob the place? One of the initial stories was that they had broke in to steal formaldehyde, to steal fluids, because you can soak cigarettes in it, dry it, and then smoke it. And it's a drug that is sold on the street. People sell them. 
And that was one of the initial stories that had been out there as well. So as a new young funeral director in 2002, I was worried that we were going to get broken into and there would be more crime because people were trying to steal the chemicals that we had at the funeral home. So in this story back 21 years ago really had an impact on me because it made me fearful of the living even more. Thank you guys for watching. Watch for the next Murder at the Funeral Home story coming soon.